And so let's see, I hope I have, uh, I wanted to show you a picture. Uh, this is the Planck satellite, um, enabled by United States technology and launched by ESA, the European, the Evanston Space Agency. I guess it's European Space Agency. Um, and so this march, uh, it's got polarimeters on it. It's got detectors uh, built at, at JPL on it that are very sensitive. And so uh, it hopes to see those B modes. I, this is a fun picture. The South Pole Telescope, which I told you before, is being outfitted uh, to detect B modes as we speak. And here is an airplane flying into the South Pole because there's a bunch of experiments. One of the best places is to study the microwave background. If you can't get on a satellite, it's at the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of people chasing this wild goose. And we've got our finger, fingers uh, uh, crossed. And it's a very, very hard experiment. And uh, the people who are doing it are very, very brave because, you know, doing a hard experiment is one thing. But then saying, well, you know, we don't quite know what the answer is. Just, you know, measure the, you know, make it your experiment as sensitive, as sensitive as it can be. Okay. Oh, and here's a better picture of the South Pole Telescope. Ten meter telescope. I forget if it weighs, I think it weighs something like a million pounds. Uh, uh, at the South Pole, uh, uh, there's a fun story about when they assembled it. When they assembled it, everyone at the South Pole came to watch. Because <laughs> it was on a crane, and if it fell, they wanted to be there to see it. And uh, so this is a, it works spectacularly well. Uh, and actually, I'll, I'll mention Alma one last time. So. The really good telescopes on Alma are built by an American company called Vertex, and Vertex also built this, so this is a cousin of the antennas uh, that are at the Alma site. Okay, segueing to dark matter. Uh, so dark matter, this is the one where I think we have the best chance of closing out the problem. And why do I think that? Uh, because Chicago is the best basketball team, <laughs> and, and the best uh, political basketball player uh, Barack Obama. And it's because we have a full court press. So we've got three different ways to uh, test this hypothesis that the dark matter is particles left over from the Big Bang. Uh, so I'll just show you in turn, we can directly produce, we can bottle them. Uh, we can uh, detect the dark matter particles that hold our galaxy together, and we can uh, look for them to convert into something else. So uh, here we have what I call a dark matter factory. And this dark matter factory is located in Geneva, Illinois. Uh, this is Lake Michigan. <laughs> Actually, I guess that's a sad story. It's in Geneva, Switzerland. This is better known as the Large Hadron Collider. So this is where the Higgs was produced. And um, actually, uh, that's the, a very beautiful detector, the CMS detector. And that's the detector the University of Virginia is involved in, Brad Cox and his team. And this detector, I saw it when it was being built, it is just stunning. It is really big. How big? 10,000 tons, I believe, is the answer, or maybe 8,000 tons. But anything, a lot of things weigh 10,000 tons. It's really complicated. If you take a tiny little piece of it, it's really complicated. It has uh, uh, 100 million channels of information. So it's uh, very, very spectacular. And so, uh, I always thought it was number one on their wanted list, the dark matter particle, but apparently it's number two after the Higgs particle. So the idea is that we believe that the, uh, if, if we look at what the theorists predict about the properties of the dark matter particle, that you could produce it at the LHC and identify it. Um, but wait, there's more. So remember, the halo of our galaxy is teeming with these particles. And they're very hard to see, because they behave like neutrinos, but they occasionally, there's lots of them up there, they occasionally bump into one another and annihilate and turn into things that we can see, like positrons, that's the antiparticle of the electron, uh, a gamma ray, that's a fancy name for the photon, or a high energy neutrino. And so this is the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Space Telescope, let's see, Fermi, was at the University of Chicago. NASA seems to name all of its satellites after Chicago scientists. This is a, uh, uh, a satellite that was launched by a European consortium called Pamela, and I'll show you some data from it. 
And then this is the space station, and this is an experiment on it uh, looking at positrons called AMS, antimatter uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer. That's what it stands for. Or no, antimatter search, I can't remember which one. And then this is just something absolutely spectacular that you paid for. It's just stunning. It's a kilometer cubed of ice at the South Pole, fully instrumented to detect neutrinos from throughout the universe. Uh, just a breathtaking project that involves how do you drill in ice? Does anybody know how you drill in ice? Hot water. So a giant hot water hose, you drill a hole, how deep do you drill it? Two kilometers. And then you put down a string of phototubes. And so it's looking for dark matter particles, not that annihilate in the halo, but happen to get trapped in our sun, find a mate, annihilate, and produce neutrinos uh, that can be detected. And let's see, I hope I have this. So, okay, I'll let you in on some data here. So somewhere, uh, this is uh, data from, oh, again, Monet, Impressionist. Uh, this is the number of positrons divided by the number of electrons. This is what the, we think astrophysics, most of the positrons that have been detected are just from astrophysics making them. And then all these kind of uh, points are data. The red ones are the really best data, and that's from Pamela. And uh, there's a reason it doesn't agree with the curve here. But what's really interesting is look at these points climb up. And uh, there was a paper that predicted that they should climb up, and I was one of the authors of that paper, and uh, predicted they should climb up and fall down. Oh, they did fall down. Well, they didn't fall down. Pamela just didn't get any more data. And so uh, this is tantalizing hint. Of course, once they saw the hint, uh, people said, well, I can imagine an astrophysics source that would do this. And so we're anxiously awaiting AMS uh, to see uh, what happens when you go to higher energies. Does it fall down? Uh, so that's the question mark. What do we have next? Next we have the direct detection. So I told you, I think I mentioned this, or maybe it was to some students, that if you have a coffee cup, now you're not allowed to drink liquids in here. Uh, only the speaker is allowed to drink. Um, there's about one of these neutralinos in a coffee cup. Uh, but they're very shy. So they're not going to stir your coffee. And uh, So you need to build a very sensitive detector to see if they're there. And let me tell you how the detectors work. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, so here's a detector. It's a bunch of material. And one of these neutralinos comes in. It bumps into a nucleus. Uh, uh, and then it is deflected, and it gives the nucleus a tiny little bit of energy, a teeny tiny little bit of energy. For the experts, about a keV, a kilo electron volt. And you now have to detect that, and that's really hard to do. And I'll tell you one way you can detect it that's absolutely stunning. So this is an experiment called the cryogenic dark matter search. And you're looking at this thing, and what the heck is that? That looks like a big refrigerator. That's what it is. So this is a refrigerator that goes down. It will definitely uh, freeze anything you own. It goes down to 10, 10 millikelvin, 10 uh, thousand of a degree above absolute zero. And when you take a bunch of silicon or, or germanium to that temperature, if you deposit this tiny amount of energy, it'll heat it up. And you can measure that heating. Okay, oh, everybody's excited. So, now, but now, now let me tell you the bad news is that that sort of event happens about once in 100 kilograms per year. And then there's a footnote. Well, we're not sure that it might not be one in a ton per year, but go ahead and look anyway. And so there are a bunch of experiments looking to do that. Now, it turns out that there's all kinds of particles coming from above us called cosmic rays that uh, can interfere with that. And so you have to do this in an experiment under the Earth where you're shielded by the Earth. And so this is fun. These experiments are now getting the right sensitivity. And there is a signal that's been seen. And, uh, boy, I have more graphs today. I apologize for that. Uh, so the signal that's being seen uh, goes up, it goes down, 
goes up, it goes down. It goes up in uh, June and down in December. So it's a yearly signal. And uh, oh, some theorists predicted that uh, the dark matter signal should go up and down because uh, we're going around the sun. So it has just the right modulation. But of course, there you know maybe it's the changing temperature uh, of the equipment or the humidity in the mountain that's causing it to go up and down. And so there was an article in Science Magazine about a year ago, possible site of dark matter fires up search and tempers. So uh, the, the exper I'm trying to convey the fact that the experiments are have the proper sensitivity in one last picture of this ilk. Here's the promised land, and here's the sensitivity of the experiments. So they're hitting the promised land. And oh, axions. I promised to say one word about axions. Um, this is uh, wonderful, and I could get contradicted here, so I have to be careful. So the axion is very different than the other dark matter particles. Instead of being really heavy, it's really light. It weighs uh, one trillionth, if it exists, one trillionth of what an electron does. And everybody knows an electron is really light. And how do you detect it? It's really fun. When it sees a magnetic field, it turns into a photon. And photons are easy to detect. And the mass of the axion is such that the photons it turns into are microwaves. And it turns out that the people up the road at NRAO are really good at detecting microwaves. And so this experiment involves building a very sensitive microwave receiver. And uh, this crew of people, which is now much larger, have done that, uh, partly based upon the expertise of, uh, or, and help from, from NRAO. And they haven't uh, seen a signal yet. So the dark matter decade, full court press, that's what I just said. And I, I love this term. There's lots of chatter. So we all know the word chatter now. So there's this chatter, you know, uh, positron line. I didn't show you some gamma ray lines, some annual modulations. Uh, we're right, seem to be on the threshold of discovery. And so I think there's a very good chance to finish the dark matter puzzle this decade. And I wanted to add something for full disclosure and, and honesty. Uh, well, if you're a cosmologist, you don't really have to be honest. Um, <laughs> there could be a surprise. One of the things that uh, I what said was the most conservative hypothesis, the corner that we've been pushed into by our Sherlock Holmes logic, is that it's a new form of matter. Uh, well, that doesn't have to be so. Most conservative is not always right. And um, so there are other views. And uh, this is an astronomer. Uh, of course, I noticed he wasn't invited to give these lectures. But, uh, and uh, there is a uh, alternate explanation. I, I don't even like to say the words uh, mon, modified Newtonian dynamics. Does everybody know that F equals ma? So according to modified Newtonian dynamics, when a is really small, F equals ma squared. Well, does that sound like the right equation to you? Anyway, it's, uh, I'm, I'm playing around here, but uh, so I don't think this is right. And you're free to photograph this. If mind is right, I will eat my PowerPoint, the laptop included. But there could be a surprise. There could be a surprise. Just because we think we have nature cornered, uh, we, we don't necessarily.